Okay. Um, thank you, Chairman. So at, at the request of uh, Melissa Miles, who is the Director of Training for New York State Department of Correction and Community Supervision, um, she has requested to table this discussion, this agenda item until September's meeting instead of today. Um, OPS staff met with docs this past Friday to discuss uh, this agenda item with them in detail. And uh, after meeting with them, OPS, uh, after meeting with our, uh, you know, OPS staff, docs felt that they would be uh, better positioned to present a more thorough presentation at the next meeting. Um, and, and further, I'd like to add additionally to this particular item here, that now that the updates to the basic course for peace officers have been completed, um, which as the council knows, um, the basic course for peace will require 162 hours of training beginning January 2021. So the next step will be for those other peace officer employers who have received an exemption from the basic course for peace officers in 2011 to return to the council to request a further exemption um, based on the recent updates the council has approved. So in, in summary, the council should, should expect to not only see docs uh, in subsequent meetings, but also the Office of Probation and Correctional Alternatives, uh, FDNY, and additionally NYPD. Um, in the meantime, um, OPS staff will continue to work with these agencies in preparation to present to the council um, to assist them with further uh, exemption requests from the requirements of the basic course for peace officers. Um, so in September, um, we should definitely expect to see uh, um, New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, and it may be very possible to see these other agencies as well in September or maybe in the December meeting. Obviously, they would get before the council um, prior to January 2021 to request a further exemption from their courses from um, the, re the new requirements that the basic course for peace officer will stand at, which is the 162 hours that will be required beginning January 2021. So with that, I have no uh, further information on this particular agenda item. Um, I will uh, entertain if there's any questions regarding this agenda item. I'd be uh, more than happy to do my best to, uh, to answer it. Uh, any questions from any council members? No, Bruce. Okay. All right, well, thank you. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll address that in, uh, in uh, September. Um, thanks again. Um, the, um, uh, the, the hate crimes training regulations is next on the uh, agenda and, uh, that takes a quorum to, uh, to, to, uh, to pass that. If that's what we intend to do, uh, we would need Char chief Chartel to be on, uh, for that. Um, have we heard from her as yet, Josh? Uh, Sheriff, we're, we're working with her right now. Um, she should be hopefully connecting momentarily. So maybe we, may I would suggest we, we skip this agenda item and move on to the next one and then revisit it uh, when Chief Hertel is definitely connected. Okay, that, that sounds reasonable. Okay, Hi, item, uh, oh, go ahead. Hi, it's, it's Natasha. <laughs> um, it, um, I just wanted to make it noted that we've always had a forum. We just didn't have the five for the red. Well, that, yes, uh, we, we, right. we, we, we need uh, a correct, uh, correct. Thank you. Uh, we need, we need at least five to do the uh, regulations uh, and regs uh, which, which this falls under. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right, then, uh, Josh, let's move into uh, agenda item number four on the bylaws amendments. Sure. So um, turning our attention to the bylaw amendments, uh, action item number four, um, to amend the bylaws, the council must first introduce any amendments at a meeting and then vote on them at a subsequent meeting. Um, during the previous council meeting, and pursuant to article nine of the MPTC bylaws amendment requirements, the council discussed a further motion to occur at today's meeting to amend the bylaws in two areas. Um, so just to, to recap what was discussed at the previous meeting, um, which had to be presented um, to the council, and then the council could then act on the uh, proposed amendments to the bylaws 
during this meeting, but I'll, I'll recap what was discussed in the previous meeting uh, for the council to consider for adoption uh, to the bylaws in this meeting. Um, so in your packets on uh, page seven of the bylaws, um, in, in red font, there's an addition proposed amendment to add additional language that basically it's more of a housekeeping item to include the language in, in statute, which is from Executive Law 839 Subdivision 5 that authorizes the council to establish its own requirements as to a quorum in its own procedures with respect to the conduct of its meetings and other affairs. However, provided, and this is the caveat which we, were, we just discussed with uh, council, that all recommend, recommendations made by the council to the governor pursuant to Executive Law 841 shall require the affirmative vote of five members of the council. So that was never in the bylaws. Um, as we reviewed the bylaws, um, that was a recommendation that was made to um, add that portion in there um, for clarity um, that um, the authority is given to the council to establish its own quorum and uh, procedures for conducting its meetings. However, um, it needed to be clear now that uh, uh, all recommendations made to the governor for uh, promulgation would require the affirmative vote of five members of the council. So that was the one, one amendment on page seven of the bylaws. Uh, the second amendment is uh, found on page eight. Um, and at the last meeting, it was recognized that uh, uh, New York State Police often sends uh, a representative of the superintendent to the council meetings. Uh, in the event the superintendent is appointed by the council appointed to the council by the governor and is unable to attend, um, the amendments to the quorum section in the bylaws would allow the superintendent to designate someone within New York State Police to attend the meeting as his or her representative and counted in the determination of a quorum. And along those same lines of a quorum, um, this would also uh, pertain to the voting. So in section four, voting uh, the superintendent, if the superintendent is appointed by the governor to serve on the council, this amendment would allow for the superintendent to designate a person and cast a vote on behalf of the superintendent. So those are the, those were the proposed uh, changes um, to the bylaws that were brought up in uh, March's meeting and are now being presented to the council um, for uh, adoption uh, to the bylaws. Um, if there's no questions, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to the chairman. <clears throat> Josh, I just want to let you know that uh, Chief Shortell is on now. Okay, uh, Thank Chief, you. Chief, uh, Chief Shortell, can you hear us? Uh, Chief Shortell, this is Chairman Spike. Can you hear us? She sent an email um, saying she could hear. I'm just maybe she's on mute. I just. I need to know, yeah, I need to know what call-in user she is. Um, I, can, I can certainly work with her on that. Okay. Okay, then, uh, yeah, you work on that uh, then, Josh. Uh, yeah, uh, any, uh, would, uh, would Chief uh, Precy, would you like to, uh, to read the, uh, the motion uh, that's before us on this uh, uh, action item four? Motion adopt the, uh, hang on, let me, is it, is it, the motion, is it the one that, that's on the uh, PowerPoint or would it be in the material set? It would, it would be on the PowerPoint, uh, Chief. Okay, motion uh, adopt the MPTC bylaw proposed amendments to the following section, section two, conduct of, conduct of business, section three, quorum requirements, and section four, voting requirements. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, do I hear a second? Uh, Bruce McBride, second. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion by uh, council members on this uh, motion? Okay, hearing none, um, uh, my vote is yes. Uh, Chief Breezy, your vote? Yes. Uh, Dr. McBride? Yes. Uh, Dr. Clofus? Yes. 
And Chief Shortel, uh, if you're on, your vote. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, uh, Chief. Oh, okay, great. I can stop screaming. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, yes, you got my vote. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, just to hold on, uh, Chief, we're, uh, uh, that motion passes. And so we're going to go back to uh, item number three on the hate crimes, hate crimes training regulations. Uh, Josh, if you could go over that while Chief Shortell is on the phone, we have a uh, voting quorum for regulations present. Uh, if you would go ahead with, uh, with that item. Sure, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Okay, on, uh, on November 25th, 2019, uh, the governor signed a bill to amend Executive Law 840 directed the Municipal Police Training Council in consultation with the Division of Human Rights to develop, maintain, and disseminate written policy and procedures regarding the recognition of res and response to hate crimes. Um, the council approved updates to pre-existing investigations of hate crimes model policy during the December 4th, 2019 meeting. And then following the meeting, the Office of Public Safety disseminated the revised policy to law enforcement agencies. Um, now, the bill also directs the council to recommend to the governor rules and regulations with respect to establishing hate crimes training for new and current police officers. With any training regulation recommendation must first come the related training curriculum. So pursuant to the bill language, the Office of Public Safety presented to the council updates to the recruit hate crimes training curriculum, as well as an in-service curriculum for the training of current police officers during the council's March 2020 meeting. The hate crimes curriculum was already a component of the basic training for police officers. However, a MPTC approved in-service curriculum didn't exist at the time. So the in-service curriculum was derived from components of the basic training and model policy and adopted by the council during the March meeting of this year. So now that there was, there's a hate crime curriculum in place for both new and current police officers, the final component of the bill is to require the council to codify regulations the requirement that hate crimes training be conducted by academies and agencies in accordance with the minimum training standards established by the council. Um, that, so unfortunately, the council didn't have enough voting members present during the March meeting to move the proposed regulatory amendments to the governor. And this last piece of the bill was tabled for this meeting. So the proposed language in your packets and uh, on the PowerPoint slide that you see is what DCGS is suggesting to the council to adopt and recommend to the governor for promulgation. The proposed regulations for NYCR 6022.3 would require any in-service hate crime training reported to DCGS for issuance of an MPTC certificate to meet the minimum training requirements established by the council. With respect to the basic course for police officers, uh, NYCRR 6020.3 requires the same, that hate crimes minimum training standard components of the BCPO must be met for issuance of the BCPO certificate. So the language, um, just to back up um, the bill, we've already done, the council's already adopted the model policy. Um, the council has already um, adopted uh, the in-service training curriculum and also adopted any updates to the pre-existing hate crimes component to the basic course for police. So the next part of this process is what um, the council would be uh, considering for a vote today would be the proposed uh, regulations that's the final component of the bill to recommend to the governor requiring that any training regarding the recognition of and response to hate crimes to be conducted in accordance with the policies and procedures and minimum standards established by the council. Those regulations would appear in the regulations that, that um, uh, provide guidance to conducting the basic course for police officers and also included in any in-service course minimum standards that are part of the NYCR Part 6022 section. So the motion um, that's being recommended to the governor or to the uh, council is to approve and recommend to the governor the proposed amendments to NYCR Part 60.3 and 6022.3 regarding hate crimes training for new and current police officers. Um, if there's any questions, uh, I'll be glad to answer them. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, definitely approved. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Josh. Uh, any um, 
as we know, this was a bill that was signed uh, last uh, fall uh, by the governor from legislation which affects uh, Executive Law 840. And so uh, this, uh, this is the regulations. We've all reviewed these. Uh, Dr. McBride, uh, would you uh, make that uh, motion? Um, certainly. Um, the motion is to approve and recommend to the governor the proposed amendments to the New York Codes, Rules and Regulations Part 6020.3 and 6022.3 regarding hate crimes training for new and current police officers. Okay, thank you. Uh, 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 would I entertain a second? Chief Shortell, would you second the motion if you agree? Second the motion, sir. Okay, thank you, Chief. Uh, if there's no further discussion, we'll proceed to vote. Uh, my vote is yes. Uh, Chief Parisi? Yes. Uh, Dr. McBride? Yes. Chief Shortell? Yes. Uh, Dr. Clofus? Yes. All right, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that uh, hate crimes training regulations, uh, a motion does pass. And, and I, uh, we appreciate everyone. Uh, Chief Chartel, we understand if you do have to leave, you're busy down there. Uh, uh, we, we appreciate you coming on board uh, for that discussion especially. And we'll move on to the next action uh, item, which is uh, on uh, K-9 teams quarterly maintenance training requirements, which is a lot of concern across the state by law enforcement. And uh, uh, Kevin Fairchild, uh, if you're on there, if you would uh, address it, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman and members of the council. Uh, I didn't think my first presentation to you all would be anything like this, but without further ado, um, in March, I began to receive inquiries and concerns about what would happen to canine teams who failed to meet the quarterly maintenance training requirement. Uh, at this point, agencies were starting to stop training or had to utilize the teams on the road instead of allowing their usual maintenance training days because of response to COVID-19. Uh, I decided to reach out to canine trainers and maintenance trainers across the state for their input on what we could propose at this meeting um, to help teams maintain certifications without compromising the quality or number of hours required for maintenance training. Well, I'll get into that. Uh, I just wanna give you a little more information on the certifications and maintenance training requirements and what happens if a team fails to meet them. Um, so you see on the PowerPoint, there's different disciplines, patrol, tracking, article search, scent detection, and narcotics detection team certifications. Those are valid for three years, and then you have explosives detection team certifications, which are good for one year. Um, a team needs to complete maintenance training at the rate of 24 hours a quarter, and uh, if they're dual purpose, um, cert they're certified in any combination of patrol, tracking, article search, scent detection, um, they're required to complete an additional 24 hours of maintenance training per quarter for explosives and narcotics. So just to give you an example, if you have a patrol and narcotics team, they would need to complete 48 hours per quarter. Um, they would also need to pass a performance evaluation in addition to the maintenance training to become recertified. Um, any questions before I move on to the next slide? Uh, hearing right. none, go ahead and move on. All right. Um, teams failing to meet the quarterly maintenance training requirements are required to complete an approved course by us for previously trained handlers and previously trained uh, canines prior to recertification. This is also called a, a refresher course, but no provisions currently exist within the MPTC approved canine standards to allow for an extension to the maintenance training requirements. Um, I put the minimum hours of the courses in there just to give you an idea of the burden. Um, patrol being 100, tracking 30, article search, then detection 10, narcotics 40, and explosives would be 80. Uh, as you can see, the hours begin to add up quickly for these courses for any canine teams who fall out of compliance with the quarterly maintenance training requirement. 
um, the teams that are being hit the hardest um, are the explosives teams who are being utilized in areas which have been hit hardest by COVID-19 and are only good for one year to begin with before they need to recertify. Um, just to give you some numbers, approximately 30 explosives teams have already expired this year and haven't recertified with about 150 more that are set to expire at some point the rest of this year. Um, but the effects could of, of this maintenance training issue could affect to um, close to 700 teams that are unique certified K-9 teams across the state. Um, so K-9 trainers and maintenance trainers across the state have expressed concerns with their inability to complete maintenance training as a result of their agency's directives, response, social distancing, staffing shortages related to the ongoing pandemic. Um, based on feedback received from the subject matter experts in the canine field, um, we are proposing two motions which are on the next slide. Um, if these motions are accepted, this will allow teams to maintain their certification during this pandemic with a six month extension while giving them the opportunity to make up the maintenance training actors by changing it to a total annual requirement for only this year. Again, the teams would still need to pass a performance evaluation as is normally done and the total maintenance training hours uh, requirements are not deviating from the standards. Um, the, the alternative, I believe, will be an undue burden on agencies to send their K-19 to a uh, refresher school. That is if they can find an agency willing to sponsor one right now or a full trainer who's available to instruct it. Um, in the middle of this ongoing pandemic, um, some trainers believe it could result in their agency making the decision to not even seek our recertification once it lapses because uh, the canine program isn't mandated and maybe they can't afford to give up personnel for that extended period of time right now. So I can read the motions if you like or if you... No, I, I, uh, I don't think that's necessary, Kevin. Uh, uh, we are living in unique and unusual times with this pandemic which uh, and we're trying to uh, strike some kind of a compromise here, which uh, which can still, uh, you know, respect the training and, and respect the maintenance and what have you. So uh, we, uh, I appreciate the job you've done putting this together. Does any uh, 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 council member have any uh, uh, questions for uh, Kevin? Okay, uh, uh, hearing none, um, uh, uh, Dr. Klofus, uh, would you uh, go ahead and uh, read those motions? Uh, we'll deal with motion one and vote, and then we'll vote on motion two separately. Motion one, uh, grant one-time extensions to MPTC K-19 certifications expiring between March 1st, 2020 and December 31st, 2020 due to exigent circumstances in relation to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic for a period of six months from the current certification expiration date. Okay, do I hear a second? Uh, second, Bruce McCrone. Okay, thank you, doctor. Uh, any further discussion on motion one? Hearing none, uh, my vote is yes. Uh, Chief Parisi? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Uh, Chief Shortell? Yes. And uh, Dr. Clofus? Uh, Yes. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, motion one uh, does pass, and uh, proceed with motion two, Doctor Clofus. Motion two: Allow MPTC certified K-19 teams the ability to satisfy all requisite maintenance training for calendar year 2020 prior to December 31st, 2020, due to exigent circumstances in relation to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic in lieu of requiring maintenance training requirements be satisfied on a quarterly basis. Okay, uh, do we have a second to motion two? So moved, Bruce McBride. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. McBride. Any further discussion on motion two? Okay, hearing none, uh, my vote is yes. Uh, Chief Parisi? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Uh, Chief Shortell? Yes. And Dr. Clofus? Yes. All right, uh, thank you. That uh, motion two does pass. And uh, 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 Kevin, uh, thank you very much for uh, your time and staff's time uh, devoted to this. It's an important uh, topic uh, uh, across the law enforcement across the state. So thank you very much for, for that. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, the uh, next on the agenda uh, as an action item is uh, defensive tactics regarding the COVID-19 and, and some training recommendations, uh, which, uh, uh, which are important for our uh, academies across the state. Uh, Dan uh, Nedwell, uh, are you presenting? I am, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, you may uh, go, please go ahead, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. I'm happy to say that this meeting is lined up with my one-year-old nap time, so we should be screen-free in the background for the rest of this presentation. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Today, I would like to present to you for your endorsement, a document containing recommendations for academies to employ while conducting defensive tactics training amid the COVID-19 pandemic. DCJS has received numerous calls and emails from academies and instructors around the state during these difficult times for guidance on how to conduct defensive tactics training. With that in mind, DCJS reached out to a panel of subject matter experts who also assisted in the development of the defensive tactics curriculum to come up with some guidelines and recommendations for academies and instructors around the state to conduct defensive tactics training. We also had this document viewed by a member of the medical community for additional input and guidance. At the end of the day, defensive tactics training cannot be conducted without hands-on physical contact. The goal of these recommendations is to employ safety practices to limit as much as possible without compromising the instructional integrity of the course. I would now like to walk you through the document and then I'll take any of your questions you may have at the end. The introduction piece of the document found in your meeting materials really focuses on the, the, the time we're in with the COVID-19 pandemic and understanding that academies can only delay the defensive tactics training in their curriculum so, for so long as they may have a need to fill critical, critical vacancies of the agencies that sponsor through their academies. With that in mind, and looking at some of the guidelines presented from the CDC, along with suggestions from our panel of subject matter experts, we were able to come up with some recommendations for instructors around the state. The first point, we, the, the, the sections all kind of fall under three overarching themes. The, the first section really discusses defensive tactics training as a whole. The second section will focus on the recruit performance, and the third section on the instructors. So in the first section we talk about, we, we, we reference temperature checks of each recruit and instructor prior to entering the defensive training area and shall be conducted prior to any defensive tactic training sessions. Additionally, all recruits must be instructed to alert their instructors if they are experiencing any symptoms associated with COVID-19. And we have linked in a CDC guidance document on symptoms related to COVID-19. Point two is all training gear and floor mats must be sanitized after use by both the instructors and recruits. If the equipment cannot be isolated from human contact in between training sessions, it must be sanitized prior to the start of training as well. Academies must develop a sanitization plan in accordance with CDC guidelines on cleaning and disinfecting communities, schools, and workplaces. We link in some guidance documents to the CDC on cleaning those types of spaces, along with a very handy search tool for CDC endorsed and EPA approved disinfectant. Um, one of the key points here is that prior to training as well, if you cannot secure the, the, the um, equipment overnight, a lot of these academies utilize local colleges and they tend to just stack up the mats in the corner at the end of the day. And if you can't secure those mats and ensure that nobody else is going to be in contact with them, it's important that you sanitize them prior, sanitize them prior to training as well. The third point is that academies should consider utilizing equipment such as heavy bags or grappling dummies to practice control positioning and techniques and to add additional rep repetitions in. These pieces of equipment can also be utilized for various warm-up drills that incorporate defensive tactics themes. As, as with all defensive tactics equipment, these should be sanitized anytime a different recruit or instructor utilizes the equipment. Um, I've been working with some of our subject matter experts on some different warm-ups and some different ideas on how to get repetitions in. 
I did receive one video from one of my guys who kind of shot at home and were more than willing to share that with Academy to kind of show how they can use these tools to limit contact and show you some warm-ups and some drill repetitions in on their ground control techniques. Uh, point four is in accordance with CDC guidelines, recruits and instructors must wear cloth masks during defensive tactics training. Cloth masks are durable and have the ability to stand up to the rigors of defensive tactics training. Additionally, cloth masks provide a comfortable level, le level of breathability for recruits and instructors during physically taxing drills or training techniques. Any cloth mask utilized by recruits during, during defensive tactics training shall be sanitized prior to any repeat use during the next training session. Point five, all recruits and instructors must utilize heavy duty disposable nitrile gloves for defensive tactics training. This style of glove is strong enough to withstand the rigors of hands-on defensive tactics training while still allowing recruits to be able to utilize handcuffs, batons, or draw firearms from their duty belt. These gloves shall be disposed of any time the recruit or instructor leaves the training area. Point six, all recruits and instructors must utilize face masks while on academy grounds while they are participating in defensive tactics portion of their training. This includes utilizing masks for any other non-DT related training they are participating in at the academy. Recruits and instructors shall also be required to utilize face masks while on academy grounds for a minimum of 14 days after the cessation of any defensive tactics training. Uh, deep, just a, a point on that one is defensive tactics training, you can only conduct four hours a day. So there's a good chance that if they're back, if recruits are back at the academies, they may have other classes on the days they do DT training. So it's important that they wear the mask for the duration of that day as long as they're participating in DT training. And then additionally for the 14 days after the DT training, just to be safe and sure in case there were any asymptomatic cases that were passed on during the DT training. Going into point number seven, we get into kind of the recruit portion and the performance. And we're gonna talk, talk a lot about permanent small group assignments for defense, defensive tactics training. And the thought behind the small groups is to, if you have a permanent small group you're working in, you can really hope to minimize the contact with other recruits and instructors throughout the training and hopefully contain areas if, if you do have any cases of COVID-19 pop up. So section A under there is in order to minimize contact between recruits and instructors, recruits shall be divided into permanent groups of four for the duration of the academy defensive tactics training. The group, this group of four will not engage in any physical contact with any other group or instructor during the defensive tactics training. Point B, the selection of group size as four was determined to be the maximum number needed in order to conduct various team tactics, box drill, and box drills utilized throughout the training to reinforce team structural points. By having a group size of four recruits, there should never be a need to bring groups together to form any drills or team tactics throughout the duration of the training. Point C, when possible, recruits Recruit groups of four should all be from the same sponsoring agency. Many sponsoring agencies have the recruit to visit or conduct work at home offices of the agency while the recruits are in the academy. By pairing recruits with other recruits from their own agency, you further work to limit the spread of possible infections. We understand this may not be a possibility in some of the smaller academies, but it's, it's definitely an option in some of the larger academies and one that should be pursued. Any recruits who leave their group and training area for any reason, bathroom, lunch, phone call, et cetera, will be required to wash their hands and obtain a new pair of gloves prior to returning to the defensive tactics training space. All drills to be conducted that require at least two recruits will be contained within the permanently assigned group. No other recruits will cross-contaminate with another group of recruits for any reason. This kind of go back to our group of four and it's just reinforcing the, the concept that those groups of four will not come across contact with any other groups throughout the entire portion of DC training. All groups must maintain a minimum six feet apart from another group in order to lower risk of any transmission to another group during training. Additionally, all groups must have permanently assigned space on the training mats to reduce contact with areas of the mats where other groups may have previously worked. Really the easiest way to do this is to measure it, have the instructors measure it on the map and lay down some masking tape and everybody has to stay inside their own box on the map. Any equipment the recruits will come into contact with will be assigned to the group for the duration of the academy. The groups will be tasked with disinfecting their own group's equipment every day, and storage of the group's equipment should remain separate and apart from another group's equipment when the training is not taking place. So that kind of covers our recruit performance and really heavy on the small group and how they'll operate within those small groups in terms of equipment, space on the mat, and disinfectant. And the last part we really talked about is the instructor assignment. The instructor cadre will be assigned as their own small group throughout the duration of the academy. The instructors will not come into contact with any recruits throughout the duration of the training. 
The instructor cadre must follow all the same guidelines as recruits while on the academy grounds pertaining to face masks and glove use during training, temperature checks prior to training, and masking symptom temperature checks for two weeks after the last defensive tactics training session. All demonstrations of techniques or drills the instructors perform must utilize other instructors as the role players. Techniques will not be demonstrated on recruits by instructors to reduce any possible cross-contamination. Individual pairs of instructors will be assigned to select, to a select number of recruit groups. These pairs will be responsible for reviewing the recruits' repetitions of various techniques and providing any corrective feedback to the recruits. While reviewing the recruits' repetitions or techniques, instructors will maintain a safe distance. Any corrective action will be demonstrated by the instructor on another instructor, not a recruit. As with the recruit groups, the instructor group must be assigned their own equipment for use as well. These instructors will be responsible for dis disinfecting this equipment at the end of the training day and storing their equipment separate and apart from any recruit's equipment. And the last point we'd like to bring up is that DCJS has maintained for a while now a Google Drive link that contains numerous videos of the techniques we now teach in the new, the new curriculum. And we typically always made this available to academy instructors and to uh, academy directors, but we're now going to be encouraging those instructors to share these videos of the techniques with the recruits prior to starting defensive tactics training. And the hope here is that if the recruits have time to kind of view the techniques in the video, view the breakdowns that were filmed with our instructors, that way when they get on the mat, they'll have a, a little bit of background knowledge going into it and it'll better arm the recruits to be able to uh, perform the techniques, hopefully with a little less time spent on the math with having to break down some of the nuances since they've already been able to work through that in some of the videos. And uh, any academy directors that, or defense tax instructors that need access to that link can always contact the Office of Public Safety. So that pretty much wraps up the document. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dan, I appreciate that. Uh, going back to uh, number one on the temperature checks, I just want to ensure, are we, uh, are we staying with that 100.4 as uh, the, uh, the fever uh, line? Uh, to be honest, that's, that's a good question, and I, I don't think it's something we really discussed as a group. I can definitely reach back out to our medical, our medical advisor on this and get a good determination on what he feels is the best temperature to go with if we want to include that in the document. Uh, I know that generally that's uh, the, uh, one of the guidelines that uh, has been used. I just uh, was wondering if, uh, if we were staying with that. So that may be something to check on because we're, we're making the instructors uh, have their temperature taken as well, correct? Correct. Okay. Any uh, any questions by uh, council members uh, for uh, for Dan? Yes, uh, this is uh, Bruce McBride. Um, could you tell us? Um, and I know it's related to the issue at hand, but could you tell us how many academies are actually functioning right now? If if we know. Uh, that is not a question. I'm sure, Josh. I'm not sure if you have an answer for that one. Um, Dan, if I could just jump in, it's Johanna here. Uh, Bruce, I think we are going to have an informational at the end where Sarah is going to talk about how the academies have been doing the, uh, do, dealing with things over COVID, and I think that'll be covered then. Okay. okay. If I could just chime in with one other. Oh, go ahead, Bruce. You have another question. Yeah, the, I, I think these are you know excellent uh, guidelines, uh, especially for DT. But it would seem to me that a lot of this would also apply to the everyday functions of the schools. Um, I'm thinking of EVOC, firearms, um, doing role plays with crisis intervention. And um, um, I would just say this, I, I agree with this, uh, but I would also say that uh, academy directors should probably be expanding a lot of these, um, these procedures uh, to other sorts of things. I think that's um, it's a good segue into what I was going to uh, suggest. These are we're looking at these um, uh, as recommendations that we're going to be posing. And correct me if I'm wrong on that, Dan, to the academy directors for this specific very highly intensive hands-on hands training. Um, so I think it's not a bad idea to suggest that they could consider it for other types of physical activities, types of uh, things. I just wanted to say thank you, to Dan, and and the team and the medical professional who helped us with this. A lot of work went into trying to figure out the safest way to do it with the proper training um, so that we can provide 
good recommendations to the academies to help them as they navigate through this. Obviously, they're all their own individual entities and the, the helping getting guidance and endorsement on these from uh, the MP, I think, would be helpful to them as they make their decisions going forward. Totally agree. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Joanna. Any uh, any further uh, questions for uh, Dan? Okay, hearing none. Uh, 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 Chief Shortell, are you still on the line? Yeah, yes, I am. And, uh, uh, do you want to? You know, go ahead, Chief. No, I'm just telling you know the issue you were asking about the temperature. We utilize 100.4. Okay, uh, and and as do we, so uh, that's uh, that's good to hear. Uh, do you want to read that uh, uh, motion for the endorsement, uh, Chief? Yes, stand by, please. We the event will endorse this. I'm sorry, my voice is very low because I've been out all night working, but it's endorsed the event. Is this page uh, 18? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Just checking. Endorse the defensive tactics and principles of controlled COVID-19 training recommendations and direct the Office of Public Safety to disseminate the recommendations to law enforcement training academy. All right. Thank you, Chief. Uh, do we have a second? Second, Mr. Second. President. All right. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, uh, I vote yes. Uh, Chief Parisi, your vote? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Uh, Chief Shortell? Yes. And Dr. Clofus? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the uh, the motion for action item number six does pass. Uh, thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you for all the staff and the team that you've been working with for all their uh, to help with this. Uh, this is an important recommendation and uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, that concludes the action items. Let's move into the informational items and uh, the uh, there's some statutorily required training and remote training and extension approval issues uh, that Sarah Dean will update us on. Uh, Sarah, go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. I'd like to take a few moments of your time to give a, a brief overview of some of the additional ways that the Office of Public Safety has responded to outreach from law enforcement agencies as they seek guidance and assistance as a result of the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. For the purpose of today's discussion, I have broken these requests into two categories. The first being the regulatory process for granting an extension of the time limitation for mandated training courses, and the other being remote training. Due to the postponement of many training courses, some academies and employers have experienced difficulty with recruits or new supervisors that are unable to, to complete training within the mandated one year time frame. As you may recall, there's a current regulatory process that allows OPS on behalf of the commissioner to grant a one-time extension of the time requirement for mandated training courses, specifically the basic training courses for both police and peace officers, as well as the course in police supervision for recently promoted first line supervisors. In order for extensions to be granted, regulation requires the employing agency to submit a letter describing the exigent circumstances that necessitate the application. So far, affected agencies have successfully been able to articulate how the current circumstances have impacted their officers' ability to complete training within the required timeframe. And we have worked with them to provide an additional year to complete the training and remove this specific obstacle. Additionally, a temporary process has recently been implemented for approving remote delivery of certain training topics during the current pandemic. The review process is initiated when an agency reaches out to OPS staff regarding the potential of conducting a course or a portion of a course remotely. And it's a two-step effort between the training unit and the course approval unit. The training unit reviews the individual training modules to identify areas that lend themselves to remote delivery 
as well as modules that due to the practical nature of the training would not be conducive to this form of delivery. Once the permitted modules have been identified, the agency submits documentation to the course approval unit that includes the identification of the remote platform. Staff will use this information to verify that all minimum requirements have been met, as is our standard practice, and that the remote platform meets the criteria of being both live and fully interactive to all participants. Remote training proposals that do not meet this criteria are not permissible and the course will not be approved. These challenging times present us with opportunities to really work together towards new and innovative training strategies and engage in great dialogue, dialogue both internally and with our training partners in the field. Um, at this point, I'm happy to address any questions or feedback that you may have. Um, and I can also respond to the, to the previous question um, from Dr. McBride. There are somewhere around about 10 academies that are currently moving forward in some capacity with training. Um, all of the academies have implemented safety precautions and their social distancing to the extent possible. Um, many of these academies have moved the scheduling around to avoid any of the close physical contact um, and, and resume that type of training at a later date. Um, they're using larger classrooms, breaking into to smaller groups and, and uh, some of those strategies. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, has some of the academies uh, used some of the remote uh, learning uh, uh, approvals? Um, as, as I said, it is very new, so it's mostly been conversational at this, po at this point. We do have two academies that have used Zoom um, for the very, the classroom um, type delivery. Okay. All right, well, uh, thank you. Uh, any, uh, any other uh, questions for Sarah? Okay. All right, hearing none, um, uh, do, do you have anything else, Sarah, or is that, uh, is that pretty much it? That's it, sir, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for, uh, for giving that uh, update. Uh, next on the agenda is field training officer survey results, which I know several of us have uh, an interest in uh, hearing uh, that report. Uh, uh, Mike Puckett, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, and just to add to Sarah's, I spent all day yesterday uh, teaching remotely via Zoom. And although it's not as ideal for me as being in the classroom, there was an appropriate level of interaction between the students and I uh, to deliver the material. As we near the completion of the comprehensive review of the basic course for police, uh, we now turn our attention to the supervised field training component and the corresponding field training officer program. In preparation for this review, the Office of Public Safety has disseminated a survey to all police agencies. The survey focuses on the adequacy of the current supervision model and the ability of agencies to comply with the related training requirements. Uh, we had of approximately a pool of 600 agencies that could have responded. We did receive 123 responses from police agencies. Uh, agencies have just about all eyes, with the exception of the very large agencies downstate. Achieve the median median agency size was approximately 21 and a half full timers and seven part timers, and the average agency size was approximately 47. I'm sorry, 43.7 full timers and four part. -timers. A number of questions on the survey sought to establish the agency's ability to uh, comply with the training regulations as they exist now in the supervised field. Uh, training program as they exist now. As far as agencies uh, with challenges meeting the required 160 hours, uh, pretty surprised about this. We had actually 87% of agencies that were responded uh, indicate that they had no challenges meeting those 160 hours. Uh, agencies with challenges requiring FTOs to one-on-one -on -one supervise uh, recruit officers or uh, new officers, we had an 86% say no. Challenges using MPTC certified FTOs, uh, no response was 80%. Uh, 
challenges finding FTO courses to enroll officers in was an 80% response with no, and challenges meeting the rating requirements due to call volume uh, was also fairly low with 69% uh, indicating no. We did attempt to identify some of the commonalities between the agencies that uh, identified in the affirmative of all of those questions, indicating that they had some sort of issue complying with either the regulations or uh, having an FTO that is certified through the MPTC course, supervised the, supervised the recruit officer, or uh, had difficulty enrolling their officers in an FTO program. And there were some, there were some uh, commonalities among those agencies. Uh, generally, those agencies were smaller, in some cases very small, with no full-time police officers uh, and, and very few number of part-time officers. They were concentrated among small and mostly part-time departments with a median size of four full-time officers and 10 part-time officers. And we did not necessarily see any sort of regional difficulties identified where we could uh, maybe increase the offering of courses uh, regionally to, to mitigate some of these challenges. So I'll be happy to, to uh, answer any questions. We are kind of at the preliminary uh, point of the survey. We are looking to code some of the more open-ended responses to make that data useful to us. Uh, but this is just sort of a quick snapshot of where we stand with the field training office program. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. The, uh, I know the, the, some of the concerns that I have heard from um, agencies that would normally have four into an academy every year uh, for various reasons now have 10 or 12 uh, at the academies, and uh, there are some concern trying to plan ahead for uh, field training uh, uh, with the number of officers. And that's the only concerns I've heard. Yeah, and I've, I've heard that same concern for actually from the state police, which is a you know very large agency, um, not not one that has to. Um, their, their field training program is very similar to the MPTC program, and they even have difficulties with the large class sizes that they have. So I think it's a that's a challenge that's shared across the uh, across the state, regardless of agency size. Okay. Uh, any council members have any questions for uh, for Michael? Um, yeah, Bruce McBride. Uh, so we only got a 20% response rate from all the agencies, and I assume this went to police departments, sheriff's departments, university police, everybody? Correct. So everybody that is required to use the FTO course, so any police agency uh, employing members sworn under 1.2 sub 34. Right. Any, any uh, thoughts on why such a low response rate, or is this... Uh, or is this typical if we do a general survey, Michael? You know, I can't speak to other surveys of this nature. I can say that we use online surveys to address the adequacy of content delivery, and the response rates are significantly lower uh, using the online survey method than they are if we, if we force in class. Uh, but I will say that the flip side to that coin is generally we get more substantive responses uh, with the anonymous online surveys. So there, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword there with respect to these surveys online and uh, anonymous. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for the time and, and that you and staff have put into, uh, into this uh, effort, and uh, uh, we thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, to uh, new business. Uh, any council member have any new business they'd like to uh, bring forward? The only uh, the only thing I would like to uh, say uh, is uh, Commissioner Green uh, still available? Sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the uh, the one concern that I know I speak for all the council members. Uh, uh, as far as uh, this uh, quorum issue with the uh, with the council, where we can have a, a maximum of eight individuals appointed by the governor, uh, that uh, we currently have a sheriff's vacancy, a chief of police vacancy, and uh, the superintendent of state police, which is normally appointed by the governor, has not been appointed uh, as of as of this date. So. Uh, uh, having uh, those additional uh, two or three on there would give us a little bit of a bumper. So 
anything that you could do, and I know you've done a lot in the past uh, to support this, uh, is appreciated. No, oh, thank you. I I certainly appreciate your comments and concerns, and that uh, you know staff and myself um, have pushed and will continue to push. I, I certainly agree with you. Also yeah, appreciate uh, your comments at the beginning of the meeting as well. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I know that uh, it's it, that the frustrating is is that uh, the that they pass legislation and then there's bills that are signed uh, that uh, that puts regulation upon MBTC to, uh, to to come up with regulation and DCGF staff work hard to put that together, uh, such as the uh, the hate crimes, and then uh, and then not to be able to pass it uh, because of the lack of quorum is 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 indeed frustrating. So. We, we thank you for your support and uh, and, and getting the word out uh, to uh, to the government. So thank you. Okay, uh, if there's no further business to bring before uh, uh, the sure. council, yes, uh, go ahead. Sure. Sorry. Um, uh, first, I want to thank you for your comments uh, at the start of the meeting, and also uh, thank the staff and and everybody at uh, the Office of Public Safety and DCGS for what they do. Um, I know that we're all proud of the work that we've done, uh, especially with regards to the revisions of the basic school and, and some of the model policies. But uh, based on what we have going on right now, and I think I was struck by this by uh, driving down Central Avenue uh, yesterday and, and seeing all the boarded up uh, structures and obviously watching you know, the TV too much. Um, but, and I don't know if this is part of our mission, but I'll just say it. Um, it's probably time that we have a greater discussion about policing uh, in New York State. Um, because as I've always said, if we don't have the discussion, somebody else will have it for us. And it goes just beyond training. I'm thinking about um, hiring supervision, management, um, accreditation, uh, dealing with citizen complaints, uh, ranging from discourteousness to use of force, uh, in some uh, a whole number of things. So, and I would say, and I, and I don't want to throw it uh, at the steps of, uh, of DCJS, but I think. Um, we are the thought leaders um, in what goes on in policing in New York State, and it's probably time for a greater discussion, uh, especially with uh, people that who are the managers, the leaders in the field. And uh, I'll just I'll just stop right now. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Doctor. Go ahead. Yeah, no, thank you for your comments and. Um, you know, it's something that we've been giving a lot of thought to and been working on in other contexts, but we will take that under consideration and give thought to, um, you know, what we can bring to the council for the next meeting and how it would make sense to follow up on that. Thank you. Mark. Yeah. Thank, thank you, commissioner. Uh, the, uh, I'm sure the chiefs association sheriffs and, uh, NYPD and state police, uh, could, uh, all uh, uh, have contributions to uh, that discussion. Okay, uh, if, uh, is there any other new business to bring before the council? Okay, hearing none, uh, I would uh, de declare this uh, meeting to be closed and, uh, uh, and I thank everyone for your participation and, and thank everybody's involvement in this uh, a virtual meeting. So uh, with that, uh, I say goodbye and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.